CDE, the story of the common desktop environment, is really about much more than a simple desktop. Toolkit turns and tumbles and touches on an entire stack of software, mostly invented on or ported to Unix. It's the story of X, Unix, Motif, and many disagreements. As if anything in Unix could be simple. Unix, the ancestral operating system, born in the late 60s and 70s, had plenty of time to entrench and enrich itself with the help of Bell Labs. Whether the software was written for Unix specifically or not, chances were the software would eventually be ported one way or another to at least some hardware. This included, at least once they were popularized in the 80s, windowing systems and user interfaces like the Andrew Project, developed at Carnegie Mellon University, or Blit, developed at Bell Labs. These were some of the earliest examples of systems that used Windows, a design paradigm that we still see today. If you can resize, maximize, and close it, it's a window. Which brings us to a successor that we likely know the name of, X. But before we can talk about X, we have to talk about W. W was a windowing system that was originally written for the V operating system. It was developed at Stanford University in the early 80s when hacker importing culture was strong. After a while, Paul Asente and Chris Kent ported W to Unix on the VS100. A copy was given to the Laboratory for Computer Science at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, or MIT. Soon after, in 1984, Robert Scheffler wrote, I've spent the last couple of weeks writing a window system for VS100. I stole a fair amount of code from W, surrounded it with an asynchronous rather than a synchronous interface, and called it X. Overall, performance appears to be about twice that of W. The code seems fairly solid at this point, although there are some deficiencies to be fixed up. X is our reaction to W. This would be the first version of X, named X1, and was a product of Project Athena, a joint venture between MIT, IBM, and Digital Equipment Corporation, or DEC. While other systems like Andrew, Macintosh, Windows, and others worked on their respective systems, none offered hardware or vendor independence. This would be one of X strengths. A few months later, in January of 85, X6 was released and got a push toward popularity by DEC and its engineers who ported X to the Microvax, their low-cost mini-computer. X6 was licensed only to a few companies outside of MIT, but under an open-style license, vaguely reminiscent of the more current MIT license. According to Jim Geddes of Project Athena, The code we developed was made freely available under something approximating today's MIT license, probably around X version 6. And if adoption wasn't fast enough yet, the few different iterations of X and MIT's permissive license sped things up dramatically. X9, released a few months later in September, added color support to function fully on the DEC VaxStation 2 GPX, which released in December. For X itself, the Ultrix Window Manager, or UWM, was the standard window manager until Tom's Window Manager, or TWM, was chosen to succeed it. These had come up organically because the X developers intentionally did not specify any information or guidance for how things should look on X. To actually define these things and get desktops sorted out once and for all, Sun and AT&T, already partnering on the next version of Unix, published the Open Look specification. Later, Xerox would join to do Design, Review, Implementation, Testing, and Refinement. A month later, the 
Open Software Foundation, or OSF, headed by big names like DEC, Hewlett Packard, IBM, and others, announced their own venture to settle on specifications. But rather than build something internally, the group offered a request for technology. They wanted to see the best of the best. There were 40 submissions, with OpenLook being one of them. The OSF whittled the options down to 23, and OpenLook made the cut. Ultimately, the OSF chose parts of a couple different projects, neither of which were OpenLook. HP and Microsoft's CXI and DEC's XUI to create the HP OSF Motif Window Manager. It was licensed such that it would require royalty payments to use. Not to be outdone, Sun went on to build Open Windows, which was X with OpenLook on top to replace SunView, their previous windowing system. After the dust had settled on the Motif move in 1990, things started to go downhill for OpenLook. Unix System Laboratories, or USL, inherited the OpenLook Intrinsics Toolkit, or OLIT, and Unix from AT&T. As the months passed, USL and Sun diverged. USL had their canonical OLIT, and Sun developed theirs to confirm more to the OpenLook Toolkit candidate XView, which was closer to SunView. OSL also developed the Motif OpenLook Intrinsics Toolkit, or MooLit, to ease transition and free applications from having to choose interfaces. Over the next two years into 1993, Microsoft would grow more dominant, and everyone that wasn't Apple had to decide what to do. So they created the Common Open Software Environment, or COS, initiative. The Santa Cruz Operation, or SCO, USL, HP, and IBM were on board. Sun had also, finally, relented and joined as well. And AT&T and Novell also partnered up to join as Univell. These were the big six. Together, they offered manpower, money, and guidance. But others offered a little more. HP offered up VIEW, its visual user environment, already living and breathing on Motif. IBM offered its common user access model, having failed in its OS2 aspirations. Sun offered Tool Talk, a way for applications to communicate, and the work to port their OpenLook applications to the new standard. And USL offered many of the moving parts of Unix itself. In June of 1993, with these powers combined, the common desktop environment based on Motif was born. It was up against a lot of uncertainty. At XOpen Topic Group, some wanted Microsoft Windows integration. Most wanted system administration. But early development of CDE was focused on look and feel, or the standardization of it anyway. Those features would have to wait until 2.0. But even so, HP quickly followed up with an endorsement of CDE as the Unix desktop standard. In 1994, the OSF and Unix International, a body meant to standardize Unix, merged, and in 1996, merged again with XOpen into the Open Group. After a monumental amount of work in 1995, the first major version of CDE, 1.0, was released, and 2.0, when most of the big features were meant to drop, was on the horizon. Then, in September, Motif and CDE, in the beginning two separate pieces, became one, now known as CDE Motif, sponsored by HP, IBM, Sun, and others. CDE celebrations were short-lived as another contender joined the fray, KDE. Matthias Ettrick was already nipping at CDE's heels, even in naming. Though the K originally stood for cool, mm -hmm. that was quickly dropped in favor of just K. 
with a few versions in between, version 2.1 of CDE is released in February of 1997. This would be the final major release of CDE by the Open Group. And while support was still offered, CDE would soon fall out of favor. A few months later, GNOME was started by Miguel de Icaza and Federico Mena. KDE 1 released in 1998, and GNOME 1 released in 1999. Unlike X, which enjoyed a more open license, neither Motif nor CDE has anything like it. It was proprietary all the way down. That is, until May of 2000, when Motif was released as Open Motif. The code was the same, but Open Motif would closely follow IBM's public license, with the additional requirement that the systems meet the open source initiative's open source definition. Within a couple days, a new team, Less Tief, because Less is Mo, published an initial statement urging developers to migrate to Less Tief's more permissive open license. But while Open Motif and Less Tief were options for Motif, CDE was still unfortunately proprietary. And while CDE was still the standard on Unix systems, with slow development and licensing issues, some of the Unixes began to look elsewhere, with Sun being the first to jump ship. Sun announced in 2001 that they would drop CDE as the standard Unix desktop for Solaris in favor of GNOME. And while some of the later versions of Solaris carried CDE, GNOME would be the default and still is today. However, some Unixes like IBM AIX and HP UX still carry CDE in the latest versions. With Unixes still using it, but everyone else on the KDE and GNOME, CDE stagnated. But some never lost interest. In 2006, a petition to open source CDE and truly open source Motif was started by Peter Hawkins. As a user or former or potential user of the common desktop environment, CDE, I believe there would be a benefit to releasing the source code to CDE and the Motif library under an OSI-approved license. I humbly request that you, the open group, investigate this possibility and use your best efforts to accomplish this goal. Within a year, 1,200 signatures were gathered, giving the open group enough of a push to investigate whether or not it would be feasible to open source the projects. It took six years from the initial petition to do it, but it finally happened, at least for CDE. On August 6, 2012, CDE was relicensed under the LGPL and was available on SourceForge, where it still lives today. That still left Motif in the balance, but it didn't take long. On October 26, 2012, later versions of Motif were also relicensed under the LGPL. Work can now begin to rewind the clock all the way back to 1997. Or fast forward to today if you're still using IBM's AIX. And it did. Peter Hawkins, along with John Trulson, do the bulk of the work on most of the releases along with a good number of other developers. The very first release came after 17 months of work to get things compiling, and 2.2.1 was released on March 1st of 2014 with the note, CDE 2.2.1 is now available on SourceForge, though it may take a little while to propagate. Nice work, everyone. There was a little more work to be done to get things built on more modern systems, but that was mostly completed in the following July with 2.2.2. It worked on most Linuxes, BSDs, and even a Lumos, a Unix operating system. 2.2.3 in May of 2015 and 2.2.4 a little over a year later in June of 2016 comprised a ton of bug fixes and removing no longer used requirements like the XPrint extension which had long been unsupported. 
2.2.4a, the pre-release for 2.3.0, landed two years after 2.2.4 in June of 2018. A monumental amount of work went into this build and shored up a worrisome security workaround that forced RPC bind into insecure mode. That, along with hundreds of bug fixes, paved the way to the next big version bump. 2.3.0 landed a month later and stabilized the changes made leading up to the release. And a little over a year later, in October of 2019, 2.3.0a was released fixing thousands more issues and a Arch64 support, which means it's possible to run this on modern ARM devices like the Raspberry Pi. And a month later, 2.3.1 was released to stabilize all the new code and still somehow fix hundreds more bugs and reduce the code base substantially. It also brings in desktop app roots, which allows setting default applications for common file types. 2.3.2 was released in the first month of 2020 to fix some DT session issues that might lead to compromise. 2.4.0 baked for a good year and a half and released in July of 2021. It brought UTF-8 support, meaning wider language support for everyone. And PAM support meant less running with SUID root and a more secure system overall. There's also initial muscle C and risk V support. In 2.5.0, iMake was dropped in favor of auto tools, which, while still old, not quite as old as iMake. This was a substantial undertaking and took a year to accomplish. It released in July of 2022 with a ton of bug fixes and modernization of the code base. The final release, at least of this recording, 2.5.1, dropped in October of 2022. It was mostly a bug fix release, but also upgraded the corn shell. Now, before you go, hey, they didn't even talk about NSCDE. We know. There's definitely enough here to complete the history, but honestly, there's a lot of NSCDE to talk about. And with two years in development, saw its first release at the end of 2020 at 1.1, and a handful of releases later, 2.3 was released this past June. So we'll revisit NSCDE at a later date. So stay tuned for that little bit. Speaking of staying tuned, hey, you can catch all the great topics as they unfold over on our subreddit or our news channel on Discord, or hey, Levy, which is now up to date. But I got to make a, a, a little little side comment here about our Lemmy. I know there's some people that are kind of itching to join, if you will. Uh-oh, there, there's a list. There's a list of people. <laughs> hey, list of people, this is for you. <laughs> this, this is not a lot, and there's a few people that are interested. They, 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 you know, people that don't have their own instance to join. Whatever. Um, we did say we'd open it up to some friends of the show, but I got to ask, please reach out like another method because um, I don't have the email integration working on Lemmy. And I may never, because like that's one of the things like when you have a VPS, uh, email is kind of they don't really let you just email everywhere all the time, all the places. Yeah, and even if they do, you end up like weirdly blacklisted, and then you have to play uh, works, the MX Toolbox game where you're like, "Why I am I blacklisted?" And then you get it works some places and not others, and you just scratch your head a lot, right? So yeah, um, sys opping Lemmy is hard enough. <laughs> without so, having to deal with a whole entire email server. So yeah, so. if you could just uh, reach out to us, uh, let us know that uh, you're looking to you're you're a real person, um, and you're looking to make an account. Uh, that'd be cool, and uh, we'll, we'll touch base that way. You know the way to do it. If you're listening to this or you're watching, yeah, I see you. This um, Linux user space dot show. You can. Send us an email directly from right there. There's a contact us thing. That works. Yep. And you could it goes straight to our inbox. And email is fantastic. At least 
I will be the one to be like, hey, Dan, did you see that email? And then we have a conversation about it. Yeah. But yeah, that, there's, that's, a, that's a good method. Hey, that's there's great. all kinds of ways. Uh, you can uh, DM us on, I, we're still on the bird thing. Um, we are. But, you know, Mastodon is fantastic. We have that. Yeah. And people reach out there. That's a good place. Do that. And then, of course, you know, Telegram, Mastodon, Discord. We have all those too. Like you totally reach out on any of those. Yeah. Or you can watch one of those live streams there and be like, hey, by the way, I signed up for Lemmy. You should approve me. Go, go. Yeah. Go look there. And uh, we can do that. And uh, you just, you'll just have to remember your password and then go, go. Yeah. Be able to log in. You'll be good. Y- use a password manager. Don't forget it. Yeah. Don't. That helps a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Could be bad. So anyway. Yeah, if if you if you're struggling to to get logged in there, that's why. But don't get mad. We still love you. <laughs>